Great. Hello, once again, I'm Dan Cabrera, uh, a multimedia coordinator here in faculty development, and we're having people join on the session as I speak. I want to welcome everyone to the initial online offering of Converting Your Course for Blackboard Ultra. It's a very important uh, topic to discuss, especially those folks who have had a little bit of exposure to Blackboard Ultra Course View and, and maybe have not uh, made the leap to, to convert the course, but these are some important things that we'll be able to talk about, ask questions and all that. I want to introduce uh, the two presenters for today. My, my good friend, Michael Taylor, he's the Instructional Support Specialist here, and he will be joining us uh, in the second half of the presentation. I've already introduced myself, but I'll do it again. My name is Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator here in Faculty Development, and uh, offer a lot of uh, workshops, and multimedia related, a lot of Blackboard uh, workshops, consultations, and um, creating a lot of content, tutorials, and, and the like. So in today's workshop, uh, I'm going to list out some objectives, what we plan to do. This first one right here really is not an objective. It is, in fact, a, um, an activity. I'm going to be presenting the briefest of overviews, the Ultra Course View, um, or UCV. I, I want to mention that this, this workshop uh, today probably is, is made up of folks who've had some exposure to uh, Ultra Course View already, and so I don't want to be uh, repeating stuff you more more likely than not have been exposed to. So I'm just going to mention a few things about the Ultra Course View in my overview. Uh, but by the end of the session, you'll be able to identify the benefits and the costs associated with conversions. And so we'll be talking about some of the tools and features in the Ultra Course View, as well as uh, being able to list reasons to convert to the Ultra Course View. So I'll be asking the question, and it's something you might want to be considering at this point, as we go further and further into the session, you'll have more information to work with. But to, to consider the question, is Ultra right for you? Uh, the second half of the session, uh, my colleague Mike Taylor will be um, focusing on showing folks how to create shells, which is something many people may already know how to do, to conduct a course copy, to convert a shell to Ultra, to locate and review uh, conversion exceptions. We'll see what that's all about. And then to decide on a preferred workflow for conversions, because there are some options. Okay, I'm going to turn off the camera. No sense in uh, testing, testing. Te oh. <laughs> Hello. Mike, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, for some reason I'm not getting anything on my microphone coming, but I'm glad glad you're there to back me up there. All right, so um, before we get started on this conversion process, I, I assume that most of you right now are using the original course view. So I'd like to ask you, because this is relevant to our discussion, uh, what are one or two features or activities that you use in your, in your current course or the original course that you could possibly not live without? And I'll start myself, I mean, because uh, I, I offer a couple of online courses in the fall semester. I like using, um, let's see, discussion boards. I think they're essential. I also like uh, the, uh, the, the look of the menu. Um, I've worked on developing the menu. I've worked on developing a banner uh, in my course. And I use some other technologies like VoiceThread. I also use uh, Flipgrid and, and Medial and, and YouTube. So these are things that I find very, very important uh, to be able to use, and I wouldn't want to uh, lose them. So in the chat area, or if you want to just raise your hand and, and then ask, a, a, uh, use your microphone to share. OK, I see Justin is typing something. Thank you so much, Justin. Ah, reading material and course syllabus, great. Yeah, absolutely, I think we all could agree on that. That's something that's essential to what it is that we do on, in an online environment. Other folks, Marianne says the grade book. Yes, absolutely. For the instructor, absolutely essential. For students, 
There is that feature of my grades where they can see how they're doing in the course. Great. Dana says assignment portals for submitting papers. And this is really a, a great feature, especially if you have an entirely online course. How else are you going to be able to get content and be able to assess information from your students? So having that electronic submission process is, is an important component. How about one or two more? Announcements. And fortunately, they're that's a, that's still an important component, although it's going to, and that's fine, that's fine, Marianne. Uh, uh, that's going to change just a little bit, uh, and maybe for the better. Okay. How about one more? Okay, weekly folders under content section. There's something about having a structure file that you feel comfortable with, that you've worked with, and that your students, uh, it's intuitive for your students to see. So I agree, absolutely, Dana. Okay, it looks like Nora is also typing something. And then after Nora submits, we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, bit of material. Contact between students and instructors. I think probably uh, from the perspective of engagement, yes, you need to have an open line of communication between your between students and the instructors, but also between themselves, and also even in fact uh, have some sort of a direct connection with the content. Students have got to be able to make that connection all the way around. So uh, definitely, I think it's one of those communities of inquiry uh, features that makes a successful online course go. Okay, so I had some, some ideas too, uh, contacts. I like to use a introduction video for my students to be able to, for them to see who I am because we don't really sit in the, or we're not in a physically uh, the same location. Uh, wikis, um, it's not something I use, but I know that it's quite common with, with many, uh, many faculty. Uh, the banner, the banner that represents your department or the banner that represents your specific course. Uh, course menu, um, I'd mentioned the thing about establishing sort of a look to your, your online course, especially something that you feel is intuitive, something that will get your students to, to start to engage with the content from day one. So organizational structure of the course, the navigation structure of the course, the edit mode, also an important, be able to turn that edit mode on and off so that you can actually see what the students see to some degree. Uh, some folks use a lesson plan and a performance dashboard to sort of keep up with what your students are doing, how they're doing in the course. Okay. So I'm going to start a little bit about uh, talking about the benefits and the costs that are associated with the conversion. And I'm going to do that by sharing some of the, the, uh, the tools and the features. Uh, so I'm going to move on here. It just take me a second to get into my application share. Okay, so you all should see uh, the an important website. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the link. I don't want you necessarily to uh, click on that link right now because I'm just going to be sharing that link with you. But I do want you to um, copy the the link so that you can use it at some time in the future. Uh, if you want to make the 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 screen a little bit bigger, then we're looking at the Ultra uh, Course View Blackboard Ultra Course View web page. Try double clicking on it. And it'll get a little bigger, but if it does, it might be a little bit too big. Um, okay, now it's fine. Yes, you'll have to scroll up and down just to, to, to be able to move that. Anyway, so what I want to do is, is have that really quick look at the uh, features of the Ultra Course View. And, and, and it's not to say that, that the original is, is, is worse because of it. But just some highlights uh, that Blackboard uh, really wants to, to promote. A clean, modern look. It definitely has a different look uh, than the original course view. Uh, content is displayed on a single page. Uh, adding content wherever you want is also a possibility. Adding files via drag and drop. Building complex uh, content as a document. And let me give you an example of what that looks like. In, in this case right here, it's almost like creating a web page. 
as you can see, we, ha we do have content. We have an image file right here. Then there is a specific, uh, specific text information right here as well. So it gives uh, actually kind of a nice look to uh, your content presenting it in a slightly different way than maybe what we're used to instead of just having links or, or files. There is a different text editor. Okay, you can see that rather than having the three rows of icons, we just have a single row of icons and of course each icon uh, has a specific value, has a specific use or, or functionality. So it's just getting used to how that is used. I'm just going to go down just a few more. Let's see. Easy to understand item view for the grade center. And I think there are, yeah, are two, the grid view and the list view, uh, that changes how you view the uh, material that's submitted by, by students to be able to grade that a little bit differently. Okay. And then um, this last one right here, I'm just, I'll, I will send. Actually, I'll, I'm going to mention two more. This course announcement appears as a pop-up in the window so that, you know, when you've created an announcement in the past, well, what happened was that students would uh, come into the session, and unless you've set announcements as your default entry page uh, when they enter the course, they may not notice that there's a new, um, a new announcement. But uh, when you create an announcement in the Ultra Course view, it actually pops up as they enter into the course, so there's no way for them to miss that. They actually have to, ha have to click on the Dismiss button uh, so at the very least, they're aware that there is a, a new message. Hopefully, they will have read that new um, that new announcement, I should say, uh, so they can move on. So that's kind of a nice feature, so that you, students are not missing that. And then one last thing that's kind of a new feature too is the use of messages. And I know that in the past, messages was a part of the original, but now it's taken to a whole new level. And in fact, it's replaced email and then some people might be concerned about that because they think email is an important way to to reach out to the students uh, although I'm not sure if there's significant research on it but it's, but anecdotally it seems that fewer and fewer students are using email or responding to email so this might be a way of of addressing that particular issue okay so now what I want to do is I want to look at the feature guide and this is a, a way in which you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of um, of the original course view for some of the features that that are there, and to see if in fact they exist in the ultra course view or not, uh, or are being planned to be added, or uh, maybe just uh, eliminated altogether. So as I go down this list, I'm not going to go through all of them, and it would take too much time to do that. But I'm going to point out some of the some of the more, uh, uh, I guess, common ones. Adaptive release. There is something called conditional availability, which is slightly, slightly. Uh, it's, like, it's like a new twist on this adaptive release. And as it says right here, date and time and performance-based release is available now. However, membership-based release is not yet available. And additional capabilities are planned. So if you have adaptive release for people who are members of a certain group, maybe you have a... Um, uh, a combined course, you combine sections, and maybe you have an, an honor section or you have a graduate section as well as an undergraduate section, and you want to separately uh, release information to that different uh, group of students. Well, right now, that's not possible if it's based on membership. Uh, in fact, uh, as it, this is stated right here, it says date, time, and performance-based release information is currently available. However, that's not to say that it won't be changing uh, in the near future. Um, announcements. I think I've already talked about how uh, announcements have uh, have uh, uh, is currently available with some limitations. So if you are creating an announcements and you click on announcements under details and actions in your Ultra course, you can have access to making an announcements. You can even have they can even be scheduled in advance, which is also available in the current uh, in the current uh, original course view. But announcement appears as pop-ups, uh, in a, uh, and when students enter the course, so they can't really um, miss that information. Co of course, there's other places where announcements will appear, primarily in the activity stream when students come into uh, log in Blackboard in general before they even come into their course. 
However, there is a feature loss and that's an announcement can't be, can't be sent to students via email, which is a feature we had in the past. However, you can use messages to send announcements via email as well. This is sort of a workaround uh, there. Uh, attendance. Attendance is a really popular uh, feature in Blackboard. It's one of the nice things that, about this is that it keeps those features that are really well used and, and appreciated. And it's an, as you can see right here side by side is that Original and Ultra both have attendance and it is currently available obviously. However, uh, other uh, features like blogs, it is to be determined. They are still working on it and it says right here it's in research. So it's something that's not yet developed, but it could be uh, included in the future. They do make a recommendation, though. If you have to use discussion board uh, uh, as an alternative, you can use a discussion board in Blackboard or an external blogging platform, something like WordPress. So although, although it's outside of Blackboard, it is a possibility, especially if it's one of these features that's make or break. It's Even if it's not available right now in uh, the Ultra Course view, you can use this alternative, uh, uh, these alternative solutions as a way to get around that and still take advantage of all the other features in uh, the Ultra Course view. Wanted to point out one thing that is, well, let's see, one of my favorite tools, in fact, it's the tool we're using right now, Collaborate, is in fact available in both Ultra Course view as well as the original course view. And um, I do want to mention though, that if your course is some, as the course that you've requested, you have populated with all of your content, but you haven't made available to your students, you will not see Collaborate as, as a feature. You, it only becomes visible once you make that course open and available for your students. And so you may just decide, oh, I won't be able to have my web conferencing tool, the one that I use so often. You will be able to, but it won't be available until you remove it from being private to, to being available. Uh, okay, I wanna ask, are there any questions from the participants. Dana, you have a question. Go right ahead. Thank you. I do have a question about the messaging replacing email. So when we send a message, what does that actually look like? How do they receive it if it's not in the form of an email? Oh, uh, messages? Yeah. Let's, let's see. So, have you have you used uh, the Ultra Course View at all? I have not. So I am going from the original view, and I want to start using the Ultra View uh, next semester. So I'm just curious because I have been used to using the send email function to students. So just essentially, what those messages look like, where they appear on their. So is this something that they have to be logged into Blackboard to see? Or? Yes, they do. Actually, uh, they do. Um, Ted, Mike actually has uh, wants to chime in here. I think. Thanks. Yeah, uh, let me. Uh, I can give you a quick explanation of how it's how it's different. So inside of your course, uh, you'll have the messaging tool, and this is how you send messages inside of Blackboard uh, for any of your uh, Ultra courses. You have an option to also send an an email notification, which will send that. Uh, original message and a and a notice in to the person's email account but they will need to log in to blackboard to continue that discussion so you can't start an email conversation uh, so if you really do need to do some kind of email conversation i recommend just starting that from 0365 and contacting the student directly through that system uh, i think the idea here is to try to keep all of the course communications inside your course going forward so that there aren't multiple points of communication where people get confused about checking multiple uh, places where the, the thread might be going. So I, ho I hope that helps. Um, we do have workshops that specifically go over the messaging tools and, and in our hands-on workshop, we talk a little bit about the messaging tool. So if that's something you want to learn more about we have workshops on it or you can uh, you can talk to us sometime um, you know as a consultation or something and we can give you a, a, like a demo of that okay great thank you yes that answers my question just sort of knowing where the students should be expecting to look for these messages so thank you all right thank you Dana thanks Mike 
Let's see. All right. Continuing now, looking at context. Context is maybe something that people, uh, a lot of faculty, I, I've looked at a lot of different courses, and, and, and not many people use that, but it's simply a, a way of, of posting your, your biographical information, you as the instructor, so that students can see you are. I typically will put my, my uh, biographical information in there, but also I'll have a video, as I mentioned earlier. It's an introductory uh, uh, video because my students will never actually see me in a physical location until they come, uh, unless they come to my face-to-face -face online off, I mean, my face-to-face -face, uh, office hours. I do have an online version of that. So it gives them sort of a sense of connection, uh, maybe a sense of, of, of community by, by seeing that, we're, that I'm just a regular person. Uh, you can, if you can see right here, right beside discontinue, it says there are in fact alternatives. You can use a profile feature in which you can add a photo uh, of yourself and updates that, uh, uh, an update who can view your profile information. You can put your full name and email address. Oh, they're actually, actually automatically updated. Um, and you can add additional information with each individual course. You can create a document page with information that you would that would you would have normally included in a context uh, context profile. You can put your information about office hours, uh, and that can be added to the calendar. So there is all you know. It seems to be that with everything that is taken out or eliminated, there is an alternative solution, so you can somewhat recreate that. All right. So some of the things that are not currently available, like the course banner and the course link, are in fact in research. And so they say, although they're not being developed, they're not developed yet. There is a plan uh, in um, uh, sort of the roadmap that they will be added sometime in the future. Um, it's it's something that I, I use a lot. The, the the course banner it sort of identifies, gives an identity to the course that I teach. It's also identity to the department that I work in. Uh, the College of Health and Human Sciences, and specifically uh, health studies. Okay. Course link, and once again, it's one of those things that is being planned uh, for the future. Um, I use course view, uh, the course link whenever uh, in my original course uh, view. Uh, I want to point people from one content area to perhaps the discussion board. I like the fact that they have some, uh, you know, um, keeping everything together in, in, in one spot. Uh, but this is something that will be added later on. Uh, the one thing I think that I probably lament the most is the loss of a course menu. It's not to say that it's terrible, it's awful. It's just going to give it a different look, okay? Because in, in the ultra course view, there isn't that, that what we have come to know as the course menu. There are, there are menus, but it does not look the same. Um, and it says that all of the content is listed on a single page. And it, uh, from that perspective, it does make it easier for students to navigate. Um, and in fact, links and course tools are organized in the area called details in action. All right, let's just see. And a couple more. I don't want to spend too much time on this right here. We have discussions. I use discussions a lot. It's, uh, it's an important feature uh, in my own course right here. And although it is available, if you look down here, I'm going to point this out. Uh, it says that uh, you cannot prevent students from editing or deleting their post. But replies are not deleted when posts are deleted. Subscriptions are not available, uh, but discussion posts are included in the activity stream and daily notifications. So in the past, if I wanted to make sure that people, you know, that I know that people were submitting, uh, were posting to the discussion board, and these are all graded discussion boards, I would uh, subscribe to it. I'd get an email sent that says, hey, someone's, someone's posted. Uh, and although that feature isn't available, it, it actually is resurrected in, in the activity streams. It'll say that, hey, so-and-so has posted. And so I can, rather than having to go to the course and then look to see who's posted from the activity stream, I can click on that and go directly to the place in the course where that is, uh, where that post has been made. Uh, and so actually, in, in that sense, it's very much a, a convenience. Okay. Uh, glossary. Some people use a glossary right here. It's not available in Ultra, but and and, and this isn't really much of a stretch. Just to create a, a web link to. Uh, so an existing source online uh, that has information or a glossary that you think are think is important for your courses. And of course, there are some courses where terminology is is very important. That student needs to know what the terminology of a particular field or discipline is. And it's always nice to to have that. It's that's also called professional argot. Okay. The Grade Center. Somebody asked about the Grade Center. You could not live without it. Absolutely. The Grade Center is now called the Grade Book, which I believe is what it used to be called. <laughs> it is available, but it has some uh, limitations. I'm going to look at uh, that down here. Feature loss. 
The overall grade can only be calculated based on a weighted total, but there is a workaround. You can create a calculated column for a point based total and base and base the overall grade entirely on that calculated total. Uh, columns cannot be sorted by clicking on the headers. Um, you, you guys, of course, can read this uh, on your own. Uh, one of the things that I had, which is relevant to my own course here, uh, just ending submitting my grades, last access date is not visible in the student list view, which is unfortunate, especially if you have a student who didn't do very well, who, who, who got a really bad grade, and you need to have that last access date uh, when you're reporting in my NIU, but there is a workaround. You can download the gradebook and to work offline, and you can open it in Excel. And in fact, that column, the last access date, will be visible at that point. Okay, a uh, couple of things I think I've already mentioned uh, uh, previously: lesson plan and performance dashboards, which are, for me, very important, uh, are not available in in. Uh, in uh, neither of them are available in the ultra and are not in fact intended or not are not planned however there are, as you can see are alternatives uh, for both the lesson plan and the performance dashboard and the performance dashboard is really important because it it allows you to keep a sort of a sense of, of of how students are doing in your course and if you look at performance dashboard alternatives you can view alerts within your activity stream which keeps track of assignment submissions in the gradebook and views a single student's grades by going to the grid view in the grade uh, gradebook and searching the students in the search bar in the upper right hand section of the gradebook under the course navigation icons. So you can still keep uh, a sense of what's happening in your courses. Related to that is the retention center which is also discontinued but as I mentioned that there are, there are the alternative or the solution to that is, is using the activity streams for your students so that you get you know get a sense for who's doing well and who's not and who needs additional support and let me just see do, 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 do. Um, yeah I think you can see that there's quite a bit oh wikis probably the last item right here wikis are not available in the ultra course view and, and there's no intention to use them uh, in the future however um, you guys are sort of you know uh, protected by by having an alternative some solution which is to use Microsoft OneDrive collaborative writing and editing uh, or try Microsoft OneNote for shared space for note taking. I've got a collaborative activity in my own course, my own online course and uh, in the final pres team presentation I asked students what technologies they used. I'm surprised at how many people were using uh, the Microsoft OneDrive for that collaborative writing. They were also using Google Docs uh, to, to make that. So a wiki uh, was not necessary for the students even though I am using the uh, original course view. Okay. Now comes the question: Is Ultra right for me? And I just want to make, uh, just as I did before in the previous uh, section on the feature guide, look to see what's important, what what works, what doesn't work, what's low priority, up to what's high priority. So let's look at this a little bit. So, if in fact you're looking at announcements uh, in the in the question right here. Is ultra right for me? Yes, you can use the ultra course view. Students have a lot of ways to see your announcement, even if you, if it cannot be sent as an email. We mentioned this as as, as one of the features, and it seems to be a loss of a feature like that. But there is a, there is a workaround, and and that's important to uh, to know that. So uh, this is a relatively low priority because because um, announcements are still there. Uh, they, I think they're they pretty much will, will be there for the long term. It's one way of reaching out to the students. Uh, but perhaps not in a way that we're used to. It's just working in a different, slightly different way. Blackboard Collaborate, once again, it is in the Ultra Course view, but the limitation uh, is to wait to schedule sessions until the course is open. It's really just more of an inconvenience uh, rather than uh, a major uh, downfall uh, of the tool. It's still available. And, um, and added vi visibility is a useful upgrade. Okay. Great. Let's see a couple more things right here. Let's see. This is kind of an important one because for me, I, I use uh, YouTube videos um, every every day. More than a hundred years worth of video is uploaded to YouTube, um, and so uh, there's a lot of content right here. So yes, you can use uh, YouTube videos and, and embedded videos in the Ultra Course View. However, um, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't use the embed code for some of the other things like Vimeo um, or Medial, uh, which is where we put a lot of video content. Um, however, once again, there is, there is, is also a, a, a solution for that as well as, as an alternative, putting them as links. Okay, I'm going to give an example of a medium priority. Okay, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Rubrics. Rubrics is something that I think many people use in the courses, and all the rubrics are available in the course, uh, ultra course view, but there are some limitations. And that's simply that rubrics are limited to percentage and percentage range only. So we don't use, uh, points are not used or point ranges are not used, which is what I use in my own courses. However, um, uh, another another thing to consider too is that the rubrics are not able to have more, uh, more than 10 rows and 10 columns. And so if you have a relatively sophisticated rubric, you might want to consider whether you want to move on to um, uh, to the ultra course view if that's going to be a major deal breaker for you. And then just one item on the high priority list, which is publisher integrations. If in fact your course relies on, on uh, material or content from publishers, uh, at this point right now, you probably don't want to jump into the ultra course view because it's not integrated, or at least now. And it's not to say that it won't be in, in the future or the near future, uh, but it's not ready to go prime time. So you can still use the ultra course view and, and direct your students to the external publisher websites to use materials, just give them a link. Uh, but you're going to have to to input the grades manually in the gradebook. Um, or, you, you know, you have to maybe use the feature to download them, to update, to upload uh, the dates. Okay. So if integration of this publisher content is important to you, then you may want to wait to um, uh, to jump into the ultra course view. All right, at this point, I'm going to ask, are there any more questions? Okay, I'm not seeing that right now, so I'm going to ask my colleague, Michael Taylor, uh, to come in and he's going to uh, share uh, with you his, uh, his half of the session. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Taylor. I'm sharing my screen here, and I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, steps for doing an ultra conversion and show you some best practices that you'll probably want to use to save yourself some trouble. We've done a number of tests, and we think we're boiling down a good way to proceed with this process so that you don't hit some of the roadblocks that, that are possible. Um, so let me just talk a little bit. I'm going to walk you through this uh, this thing you've made. If you've been using Blackboard since May, you've probably noticed that the interface has changed. Um, this uh, new Ultra interface has three components. One of them is the base navigation, which we're all using now, and that's the change to the left navigation here. Um, I'm not going to go over all the parts of the base navigation in this workshop, but I would uh, I would. Uh, uh, encourage you to check them out. A few really nice new features are the activity stream and the grade stream. Uh, take it some time to look at those and see how they're actually feeding you information that can be really useful for your courses. Um, right now, I, uh, you've probably been using the course view because this is how you find your courses. I'm going to show you some a course that we're going to kind of use as a, a template for today. And this shell, Etra shell 078. So let me open this up. So this is a course that was converted from an original course. It was actually, uh, you know what? Sorry, that's coming up in a second. This is where I want to start. Um, so I want to show you this uh, piece of content here. This is the is ultra right for you. Um, and I just want to go down this list real quick. And then I'm going to actually do a live demo of some of these things. So here's some things you should know. Um, when you do the, your course uh, or shell conversion, the course needs to be set to private. Um, you can revert an original course back to Ultra while Ultra is in the trial period, and I'm going to show you that, uh, how that works. Uh, your course will lock into Ultra, though, if you make it public while you're in the trial mode. And the other thing that's really important, and this kind of goes back to what Damage is showing you with the... Uh, with the features guide, Ultra is in continuous development, and NIU 
has monthly updates. So as new features are being released, we usually get them within a month. And uh, so if some of these things are on the, the uh, Blackboard roadmap, they may actually show up uh, in the next year or so. So that's something to keep in mind when you're making that decision about switching. So I'm going to walk you through a couple different uh, uh, use cases here. So if you're if you're developing a brand new course from scratch, this is probably the best time to start with Ultra. This would be my recommendation. First thing you want to do is review the teaching with the Blackboard Ultra site that Dan was walking you through. And if you're not concerned about any particular tools or features, then I would just start developing with a blank Ultra shell. And I'm going to show you how to create shells if you're, if you're not using shells to develop your courses right now. Uh, I'd recommend develop, developing your courses in a shell. And then you can copy that shell into your actual live course when you're ready. Um, if you're going to be converting an existing course uh, from Blackboard Original, again, review the teaching with Blackboard Ultrasight. And if you're not, again, if you're not concerned about any of those particular tools or features, then this is my recommendation. Uh, create a new shell and copy your existing course into that shell. So just to be more clear here, when you create a new shell, it's going to be in the original Blackboard uh, template. You're going to do a course copy from one uh, existing original course into uh, this new shell. And then you're going to convert that original shell to Ultra. So you'll have an Ultra shell at that point. The conversion process for a full uh, fleshed out course is probably an hour or so to get that conversion done. So you can, it'll send you an email when the conversion is complete, and then you can come back in and, and look at your Ultra course. Um, you're going to want to review the course exceptions, and then you're going to need to clean up the course uh, in the shell because some of the conversion process may change up the formatting and the way the uh, course is structured because the interfaces are so different. Um, after you feel like your shell is ready, to go live, you can request your new course like you do every semester. And then you can uh, convert that new course to Ultra before you do anything. It's just a blank course. It converts to Ultra. And then you can copy the Ultra shell into the new course. I think this is a, a good workflow, and it keeps you in the shell until you're ready to go live. Um, there's a slightly different version where you can, and I'm not going to walk you talk through all these steps this time. It's very similar. The difference here is instead of creating one course shell, uh, you create two new shells, and you copy your course into one shell and convert it, just like the, the last example. And then you start building your course in a blank ultra shell by pulling in the content you need and organizing it as you go. I think. These two alternative versions of copying an existing course will probably appeal to different people. I think some people might prefer to just do it all in kind of one step where everything's in front of them and just reorder it. And some people might actually like to be a little more deliberate and build the course from the parts after the conversion. Um, I, th I think we're a little new to this process to make a definitive answer on which is better. They, they both will get you the same results. And I think one might be better for you than another. Um, so please try try these out and see what you like. Um, OK, so here's a few things to consider. Um, these are some things I would advise against. I would avoid converting past live courses to Ultra. So if you have a course from, say, spring 2019 or at this point, fall 2019, I would resist the urge to convert that course to Ultra, because once it's converted to Ultra, although you can revert it back to original, if if you fully convert it to Ultra, it'll be stuck in Ultra, and you will no longer have that course as it used to be. Um, so I would just avoid converting past courses. Um, if you're going to do it, another thing, you if you're going to do that, I would highly recommend exporting the original course before you convert it to Ultra. That way you have a copy of the original course that you can re uh, re import and get that course in the original view back if you need to. Um,
Now, it is possible to convert your upcoming course to Ultra after doing a course copy, and you don't need to use the shells. But uh, again, I think until you're used to this process, it's probably better to work in the shells. And that's why I recommend working with shells instead of just converting your course wholesale. Uh, that way, if you decide to go into this process, maybe you didn't realize a certain feature in your course was important and it's not working and you can't find a workaround in Ultra, you're not kind of painted yourself in a corner here and you can, you can uh, go back to the original for the time being. Um, it is possible to revert the Ultra course or, or a shell to the original course during the trial, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. But once it goes past the trial, when you say, I'm going to keep this in Ultra, then it is, it is in Ultra going forever at that point. Um, also, here's a couple pieces of advice. Feel free to contact uh, us fac at Faculty Develop Development if you have any questions or concerns before converting to Ultra. We're more than willing to have a consultation with you and take a very close look at your course and, and look at the details that maybe aren't perfectly clear when you go through the website. If so we can help you determine if it's right to convert at this time. And also uh, come to some of our ultra workshops uh, in the coming year. We're going to be doing ultra workshops on a lot of different topics uh, that are general ultra development stuff and then more specific things around the grade book, rubrics, assessments, and how they're different in ultra. Okay, so now I'm going to actually walk you through these steps. Some of these steps might be familiar to you, but just in case they're not, this will be a good uh, refresher. So before I jump into this, are there any questions on that kind of overview that I just went over? Okay, so feel free to stop me if any of these steps don't make sense to you. Um, and I uh, and we should have a few minutes here because this is probably only going to take a few minutes to go through. And then we should have a few minutes at the end here to have some Q&A. OK, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create uh, some new shells. So the way we do that now is we go to tools. I see Dan, do you have a question? Yes, Mike, can you increase the size of the resolution uh, of that screen that you're working on just a little bit? You know how you have the, you know that. Yeah. Uh, Let me click that. How's this? Uh, how about one more time? Translating. There it goes. There you go. Yeah, it's nice now. Thank ah, you so much. It's, oh, hey. Sorry, it's lagging a little bit. So yeah, no, this is fine. It's fine. This is this makes it really easy to see. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Okay, so the first thing you're going to need to do is um, you're going to need to request some new shells. So the way to do that is you go to tools and you're looking for the Blackboard Faculty Tools LTI. So you're going to click on that. And then you're going to see My Courses and My Shells. So this is where you do your course uh, requests at the beginning of each semester. But this is where you can also do shell requests at any time. So you can build these sandboxes to, uh, to play around in and to develop your courses. So you click on My Shells, and you have the option over here to request a new shell. So you'll do that. Now, one, one thing to note here is in if you're a faculty member, you should have this feature. Uh, some of our staff that are teaching courses for the university may not have the shell request feature. And if you find that you don't have the shell request feature, just put in a ticket with, uh, with our Do It department and let them know that you need to request a shell. And they should be able to set you up with the right permissions to do that, OK? OK, so what you'll need to do is pick a subject, uh, pick a subject I'm not, a, I don't teach here at, at NIU, so I don't really have any affiliations here, but uh, let's just pick ETT, why not? Um, and what I like to do for, for my test shells is I usually give them a course number that is not something that would be recognizable as a, an actual course, so like 001 or something like that. But if you are developing a course, uh, if you're creating this shell for a specific course, you can give it the, uh, the name of that course so that you keep that in your mind. Uh, so there we go. I'm going to create this shell ETT001. I'm going to hit submit. And you're, I should see this. Your request has been submitted, and it will be processed shortly. So it, usually the course request or the shell request only takes a, a minute or so. So I'm going to leave there. And I'm going to 
the way you would find that then is you'd come back to the course menu and I'm gonna do a search here for ETT 001 let's see if it's created there it is oh there it is so usually your courses are going to show up under these shells are going to show up under assorted dates and there it is and one feature in the new ultra course listing is that you can favorite courses by clicking on this star icon that star will turn purple and it'll push it up to the top of lists so that makes it a little easier to find it while you're working on it and then when you're done with it you can take it out of the favorites list and it'll go back into the regular list okay so there is my shell you're gonna want to remember the name of your shell because you're gonna need to find it when you do the course copy all right I'm just writing this down okay all right so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you and we're not gonna actually do it but I'm gonna show you uh, this, the basic steps for doing a course copy so again, you'll want to come into courses, and you're going to need to clear out this search because it was limiting my search. So now I'm going to find a course that I'm looking to uh, looking to convert. Okay, so I'm going to look for a course that I can uh, convert. So if you notice the course coloring here on the side, these colored ones mean that these courses are in the ultra view and the ones that are gray are in the original view. So I'm just gonna pick a random course here uh, because I'm just gonna show you where this is. You probably have done this before, but uh, if you're gonna do Sorry, I got a, I had a course and I cannot find the one I was looking for. Here we go. This is the one I was looking for. Okay, so this is a screen you may see popping up from time to time. This is asking if you want to do the ultra conversion when you have a new course. I'm going to keep this one original so that screen will go away. Okay, so the course copy is done through packages and utilities. You have course copy here. See, some people are asking questions. Let me check that real quick to make sure. Okay, thanks, Dan. Yeah, so the course copy here, um, if you're not familiar with doing course copies, I'm not going to really go too deep into this. Um, but what you would do is you find the, uh, the destination course, which would be the shell we created. And, um, and then you do the course copy into that shell. Since we're kind of short on time I'm not going to actually do a course conversion today I just wanted to show it to you so that you could uh, so that you can see it okay so now I'm going to go back into courses and I want to find the shell we just created All right, so here's the actual step where we where we do a, do a course conversion. So when you create a new course now, anytime you request a new course or a new shell, you're going to see this try the ultra course view. And um, in this case, we do want to try the ultra course view. So we're going to click on this. Um, now, if if you don't see that, what you're going to want to look for is this pencil tool up here. And this is going to bring that pop-up screen back. OK, so let's try the Ultra Course View. I click on it, and you're going to get this message that your course is being converted. And you'll get an email when the conversion is complete. OK, so course conversions for blank shell like this probably only take a minute or so because there's no content to, to be converted. If you have a fully fleshed out course, it may take an hour or so to, do, to go through that conversion process. And what you'll need to do is you'll need to go out of the course list and come back into the course list. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's already been converted. You see that it is, has a color bar now. So the course is converted. And uh, I'm just going to go into the course. And you'll see that 
Now that I've converted the course, I get this pop-up at the bottom that says explore the ultra course view. And this allows you to look through the course, uh, try some things out, and decide if you want to keep it as an ultra course or go back to the original course. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is when you do an, a conversion process, your courses need to be private or unavailable. Uh, and if you go into this mode where you're in the trial mode and you make the course uh, available, it will automatically lock it into Ultra. So I just want to point that out because that may not be obvious. Um, but if you do decide that you want to keep your course in Ultra, you would just click Use the Ultra Course. And it's going to ask you again if you're sure. And this will permanently switch to the Ultra Course view. So you click on Use the Ultra Course. And now you have an, an ultra, a blank ultra course shell that you can use to start developing your course in. And so this is a, I would recommend even if you're not gonna do ultra in the near term, just make one of these so you can uh, check it out. We use these blank uh, course shells in all of our workshops. If you come to the workshop and you already have one ready to go, you can just jump into your shell and use that to test out features that we're showing. Um, so I'd really recommend getting a sh at least one shell set up so you can at least play around with Ultra a little bit to see how it works. All right, just one moment. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you real quick here is I'm going to show you a course that was actually converted that was a, like a more fleshed out course that had a lot of content. So we'll open this one up. And this course was built by Dan, actually. So it's his one of his courses. And he, he had spent a lot of time developing his course in the original course view. And then we converted it to Ultra. And this is the way that it comes over into Ultra. So like Dan had mentioned that all your content is on one page. So all of your, uh, all of your content is in this, this list view in the middle of the page here. I'm scrolling down so you can see all the different folders that were created. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details about the nuances of Ultra here. I just, for, for today, I just want to show you this is essentially what happens. And the thing you're going to want to do to help you make the decision after, you know, ideally you'd want to make this decision about converting, but you can experiment in your shell because there's nothing to worry about in a shell. If you decide that you're not happy with the Ultra course, you can just delete the shell and you haven't uh, got rid of any of your actual courses or, or course information. But one thing that you're going to want to check out here is the conversion exceptions. So if you click on this con uh, review all conversion exceptions, you're going to see a pop-up menu. And this is going to show you the low priority, medium priority, and high priority exceptions that have been generated during the conversion process. Now, some of these things are pretty trivial and they don't matter that much. Uh, let's look at some of these low uh, uh, priority. So empty forum was removed. So that just means that 14 empty forums were removed from the, uh, from the course. Um, this one also says the rubric was converted, uh, but some formatting may have changed. So you're going to want to review those rubrics to make sure that they're still uh, doing what you expect them to do, uh, that they're laid out the way that you meant, or you may have to modify them to get them back to uh, the way you want. Uh, let me, let's look at one other, let's look at some of these high priority ones that come up. So for example, blogs are, are not supported anymore, so they've been removed. Journals are not supported, they've been removed. Wikis are not supported. Um, the gradebook item isn't supported at this time. So if I click on this, it'll actually give me a little more detail. So two, you had two weighted total columns that are not compatible with the Ultra Grades book. So they've been removed. So these are the types of things you're going to want to look at to ensure that uh, you correct them. Or like I said, if, it, if it's things that don't really affect your course, they're just warnings and you can ignore them. All right, so we only have about four minutes here. Uh, I want to leave some time for any questions comments, uh, questions. And I also want to encourage people uh, to have a, a good uh, end of the year here. Uh, 2020 is coming real fast. So next semester, we're going to have a lot more workshops on Ultra. 
And of course, you can always contact our office directly and set up an appointment with one of our team members, and we can help you with your specific course. Okay, so I'm gonna just wanna open this up to questions. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, if no one has any questions, I guess we'll uh, wrap things up here. Uh, again, I just want to thank everyone for being here and thank Dan for leading this uh, workshop with us. Um, thank you, Mike. Yeah, uh, I see somebody popped a question in hope, or a comment. Uh, yep. They're expressing Thanks. appreciation. <laughs> sure. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a good uh, break. Hopefully, you get some time off, and uh, we'll see you in 2020. You can also follow up um, if you have any questions uh, with faculty development. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email with the PowerPoint presentation uh, in, in them and also a link to the recording. So if you want to come back and review some of the things that were said, you, you can do that. So that link will be following shortly. And I want to express my appreciation for everyone who came into the session taking time out of your busy day to to, uh, to come and learn something new about the ultra conversion. Good luck to you all and a happy new year. <laughs>